Yeah, we're starting to talk about Kant today. K-A-N-T, Immanuel Kant, famous German philosopher. Um, and his uh, view has had a lot of influence in, in up, up and through today. People still talk about Kant and his theory. Especially, it's interesting to contrast Kant with some of the other theories that we've talked about, especially Mill and Hobbes. But um, as a sort of background to Kant, or as a background to Kant's theory of morality, we need to talk a little bit about Kant's theory of the human being. Because as you know, um, any philosopher that has anything interesting or important to say about morality is going to be taking a certain view about the human. Who is the human? What is the human? We saw this with Plato, three parts of the soul. We saw this with Aristotle. Man is a rational animal. That was so important for Aristotle's theory of what virtue is. Hobbes thinks that we are basically material creatures who are interested in self-preservation and <coughs> driven by appetite and desire, the motions within the body and so on. Right, so any philosopher that has anything important or interesting to say about what is morality and why should we behave morally is going to have to have first some view about the human being, who is the human being, what are the basic elements within the human. So that's how we're going to start. We'll spend a little time talking about what we might call Kant's theory of human nature, and then eventually we'll get to his theory of morality. Okay? So, one of the most, one of the most important things you need to know about Kant's theory of the human is that Kant believes that the human is made up of three fundamental aspects or three parts. There are three aspects to the human being which are important for Kant. And these are, not necessarily in order of importance, reason, or the rational part of the human. This is beginning to sound a little bit like Plato, right? The rational part of the human, the intellect. That's number one. Number two is what he calls inclination inclination, the inclinational part of the human. We'll talk about that in some detail, what he means by that. And then the third part, the third aspect of the human is what Kant calls the will, W-I-L-L, -L, the will. All right, so you get reason, inclination, and the will. Now, of course, we also have a body. I mean, we have a physical apparatus. You know, there's the body, legs, arms, teeth, you know, that stuff, head. Yeah, we have a body, but we're talking about he, uh, Kant's understanding or theory of what the human person is. The person, we might even say, using that famous Greek word, the psyche, the psyche is made up of these three parts, reason, inclination, and the will. Okay, so it sounds a little bit like Plato, but it's not exactly Plato, right? Because what, what did Plato say? Three parts were reason, spirit, and appetite. So it's a little different, a lot different actually. But they both agree on the first part, reason. We have the rational capacity. We have this part of us that understands, that knows, that thinks. We think logically, we're able to figure out stuff, we're able to know stuff. Okay, that is the rational part of the human being. Now, let's talk a little bit more about inclination. Okay, so inclination, we saw this term when we were studying Thomas Aquinas, if you recall. Remember, we talked about natural inclinations. Remember that? Aquinas said we have these natural inclinations, and Aquinas said that we can sort of figure out what the natural law is based on our natural inclinations. Maybe you remember that discussion, but the word inclination, for Kant, the word inclination basically includes a number of things, but basically inclination, the inclinational part of the human includes our biological drives and instincts, okay? Biological drives, biological drives and instincts, right? We have Lots of biological drives, some are very strong, some are very powerful, 
some are maybe less powerful. We have instincts, um, you know, uh, for example, we have funny instincts like the fact that we blink when someone, uh, you know, goes like that at us, we blink. Uh, we sneeze when our nose tickles. Some of us sneeze when we go out in the sun and look at the sun, I get that sometimes. Sneezing because of the sunshine. We get hungry, we get thirsty, we get angry. Okay, now emotions, passions, are also included under this term, inclination. Okay, so inclination includes biological drives, instincts, plus also emotions, our passions, our passional nature that might drive us to do certain things. Like, for example, when we get angry, we might throw something across the room, right? When we get happy, we might uh, get up and dance and clap our hands or something like that or shout for joy. So the inclination, the, the, this general topic or general category of, of what, what goes on in the human being, inclination includes instincts, drives, biological drives, thirst, hunger. It includes really both appetites and emotions. Okay, so you remember how for Plato we said there's reason, spirit, and appetite. And Plato wanted to make a sharp distinction between spirit and appetite. Those are two different parts of the soul, if you remember that, right? Whereas for Kant, he's saying, okay, you have reason, spirit and appetite, yes, basically all part of our passional, inclinational nature. Okay, the fact that we are physical creatures and the fact that we have desires, lusts, instincts, emotions, all of that is put under the category of inclination for Kant, okay? So far so good, do we agree so far? Yeah, we have reason, we have this inclinational part of us. The third part is the will. So let's talk a little bit about this thing that Kant wants to call the will. We haven't really spoken much about the will in this class, right? It didn't come up with Plato. Plato, yeah, reason, spirit, appetite, that's it. That's it, that's the end. Kant is saying, no, there's a third part of the human which is very important to notice, and that is this thing called the will. Okay, so what is the will? The will is the capacity we have for choice, all right? We have some kind of a power within us to make choices, to decide what to do. When you make a choice, you're using your willpower, as it were. Okay, the part of you that is able to make choices about what to do is what we're calling the will. And so for Kant, it's not the same thing as reason. It's not the same thing as inclination. It's like this third power or third part of the human, the power to make choices or decide to do stuff or not do stuff, as the case may be. Right? Even when you choose not to do something, that's a choice. Okay, so that's, that's the will. Now, um, so far, so good. Does everybody sort of maybe agree, at least hypothetically, just for the purpose of discussion? Yeah, we have these three parts, the reason, inclination, and the will. Now, like I said, we haven't spoken much about the will, so I just want to spend a little time talking about <coughs> a little more about the will, and especially something that Kant very much deeply believes in is that we have free will, okay? Free will, we have free will, okay? Not all philosophers agree with this. This is a controversial topic, okay? Maybe some of you, some of you might have come across this question before or studied this. Sometimes people in an intro philosophy class might get into this question. There's a big debate among philosophers and psychologists, biologists, uh, sociologists, do human beings have, let's call it, genuine free will? Do we have, do we really have the capacity for choice? Okay, so Kant believes that we do. Kant very much thinks that human beings have free choice, we have free will. We have the ability to make choices. 
Now, the opposite of that view, I'm just going to put this term on the board. Maybe you've seen it, maybe you've heard about it, but um, there is a view known as determinism. Okay? Determinism, as you can see from the very word determined, right? Something is determined. It's like it's going to happen. If something is determined to happen, there's no choice. It's going to happen. Now, the term determinism refers to the view that Kant disagrees with. This is the view that says all events that happen in the world, including human actions, are determined to happen in the way that they happen. Okay, you got that? Determinism says, I'll say it again if you like, determinism is the view, again, it's not Kant's view, it's the opposite. Determinism is the view that all events that happen in the world, including human actions, that's an event, like if I decide to eat lunch, if I decide to give charity, if I decide to slash someone's tires in the middle of the night, that's an event. Determinism says all events that happen, including human actions, must happen the way that they happen. Now, why must they happen the way they happen? Well, according to determinism, you know, the world works according to certain, let's call them scientific laws, if you will. There's the law of gravity, and there's other natural or physical laws that scientists try to figure out what they are. The law of gravity is one of them. But there's many, many scientific rules that govern the way the world works. I mean, for example, if you take a pot of water and you put it on the stovetop and you turn the flame on and you heat the water up to 212 degrees Fahrenheit, it's going to boil, right? The water doesn't have a choice about whether to boil or not boil. If you take water and put it on the flame and heat it up, you know, real hot, it is going to boil. The water does not have choice, right? So according to determinism, the same thing applies to human beings. We don't really have choice. We might feel like we have choice. You might think we have choice. Okay, so for example, I mean, today when I got up in the morning, I thought to myself, you know, maybe I should sleep in and just not come to class today and I'll call in sick and go play hooky. I mean, that thought did cross my mind. Maybe it crossed your mind too, about you, not about me. Okay, and then you decided, you know what, I really should go to class, I really should go and take my classes because for whatever reason you decided you wanted to, so you feel like you have choice, okay. Um, when you uh, pass by some beggar or some homeless person on the street who's asking, can you help me buy some lunch? And let's suppose you have like five bucks or 10 bucks in your pocket and you, you, you pass by them and you're thinking, should I give them any money? Maybe I should, maybe I shouldn't. Well, you feel like you're making a choice either to give them or say, no, I'm gonna ignore you or I don't think it's a good idea to give homeless people money on the street. Whatever your choice is, it seems like you're making a choice. You feel like you're making a choice. Well, according to determinism, you're not really, there really is no choice. Your action is compelled to happen. Now, why would it be compelled? Because you have a certain social conditioning, let's say, social circumstances that condition you, or you have a certain kind of personality. Maybe you were brought up in such a way that you tend to be generous and kind and nurturing. And so you, are gonna give the person the money because, not because you really are choosing at that moment to do so, but rather because your genetic makeup, your environmental circumstances, your social conditioning, which we are all subject to, right? Molds you into the kind of person you are. And so whether you give the charity or don't give the charity, according to determinism, that's was going to happen, and there was nothing really you could do about it one way or the other. Okay, you might feel like you have choice, but according to determinism, 
everything you do is pre-programmed to happen just like the fact that the water boils at 212 degrees, it doesn't make a choice because that's just the way it does, it's the way it works, right? Okay, now there is a name for the opposite view and I'm telling you, of course, that Kant disagrees with determinism. So sometimes people use this term, libertarianism. Okay, the term libertarianism can mean different things in different contexts. Uh, you may know that uh, liber there's something called the Libertarian Party. Our Senator Rand Paul sometimes says he's a libertarian. But anyway, that's a different, that's a different sense of the term libertarian. It has to do with a certain political view. I'm using the word libertarianism, and philosophers often use the word libertarianism to connote, to mean the view that Kant has, that we do have free will. We do have genuine free will. We are capable of making choices over and against, or let's say in spite of our genetic background, in spite of our genetic makeup, in spite of our social conditioning, according to somebody like Kant, according to the libertarian. As you can see, the word liberty is in there, right? So that can remind you of what this means. Liberty means freedom. That we really do have genuine freedom to choose actions, at least on some occasions. Okay, so um, let's put it this way. Libertarians such as Kant will agree not all human actions are free. This is a very important thing to recognize that the libertarian is not insisting that every single possible human action is a free one. Okay, there are many situations, many cases where we do things but they're really not free, they're really not choices. Okay, so obvious examples of that would be something like if you are under the influence of drugs, if you are under the influence of hypnotism, if you've been brainwashed, whatever that means, okay? Um, if you've been just, you know, beaten or, you know, just oppressed and you're just so whacked out that you really don't have any choice but to do some action because you've been pressured and forced to do something, so then, you're not, you don't have free will at that moment, or that action might not be done freely. Okay, so it's very important to recognize that according to libertarianism, some of our actions are free, not all of our actions are free, but we have at least the opportunity, the ability to make free choices, at least on some occasions. That's what libertarianism is saying. Whereas determinism, is say, determinism says, no, there isn't a single, no, there are no free actions. They, there are actions that feel like they're free, but they're really just a result of circumstances beyond our control. You know, and so there's a big debate. So for example, the determinist will say, listen, we all know that, you know, you're not responsible for your own birth, right? I mean, at least as far as, I mean, unless there's some kind of science fiction thing going on, in general, you know, your birth, your birth is not something you chose, right? You didn't choose to get born. And the genetic makeup of your body is something that you didn't choose. Your parents is something you didn't choose, whether your parents bring you up or the parents give you out for adoption or somebody else takes care of you. Your parenting, your nurturing, especially at early ages, that's not a matter of your choice. Social circumstances outside of you, that's by and large not a matter of your choice, right? Um, so according to determinism, all of those things just influence you, mold you into the kind of person you are, and so you're acting, you're, 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 you do actions, you may be a nice person, you may be a mean person, you may be giving charity, or you may be stealing, robbing, whatever you're doing, according to determinism, you're not really choosing to do what you do. Okay? Whereas according to libertarianism, no, you are choosing at least some of the time to do what you do. Okay? Um, so again, like I say, this is a very big debate among philosophers, psychologists. There was a famous, I'll just throw out a name here, 
there was a guy named B.F. Skinner. Now, B.F. Skinner was known more as a psychologist rather than a philosopher. Uh, but I'm just throwing out a name. B.F. Skinner was a famous uh, behavioral psychologist who very much believed in determinism. Okay? Kant is over here, libertarianism. And uh, so this is all by way of trying to explain this business about the will. Okay, so according to Kant, remember, we have reason, we have inclination. Yes, we have biological drives, we have instincts, we have pressures, desires within our, you know, psyche, our body that, that incline us to do. The word inclination, think of the term inclination in the sense of we are inclined to do certain things, right? Our passions, our emotions, our desires incline us to do certain things, but Kant thinks that we still have this something else called the will where we can choose to act on inclinations or not act on inclinations. Okay, now uh, one of the th reasons why libertarian is one of the reasons why libertarians and why can't they they want to say we 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 got to have free will, we got to have free will because without free will, we're not going to have responsibility. Responsibility, yes. Okay, responsibility is that term we use when we say that someone is responsible for their actions, okay? Um, if I'm gonna say that you deserve credit for doing something good, or you deserve to be punished or reprimanded for doing something bad, that's saying that you are responsible for your action, right? To be responsible in a sense, we, I mean the word responsible is used in different senses, right? But here we're using the word responsibility to mean that, that human beings can be held responsible, that their, the action was done by them. They deserve credit or they deserve blame for what they're doing, right? So Kant um, and other libertarians would argue that if, if everything is determined and everything we do is just a matter of something that's beyond our control, I couldn't help myself, right? If I go and commit some kind of crime, and I say, well, listen, I, could, I was socially conditioned to become a criminal. My parents were criminals. My grandparents were criminals. Everybody I knew around me was a criminal, so I couldn't help myself but become a criminal. I know that's a little bit extreme, but whatever, the, uh, whatever those determining factors were, if my action is determined, it seems that I can't really be held responsible for what I do because it's not my fault. I couldn't help it, right? Um, so Kant and other libertarians see a strong connection between free will and responsibility. If we don't have free will, we're really not responsible for our actions. Okay? Anyway, how's it going so far? Uh, Kant believes, again, summarizing from the beginning, there's three parts of the human. There's reason, the rational part, there's inclination, and then there's this special power called the will, which is the capacity to make free choices to do what somehow now free will is a little bit of a mystery one of the questions we might have is how does that work if you're freely choosing to do something why why did you do what you did you know if 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 it's totally free action it sounds like it's going to be not determined by anything then one of the questions about free will is it sounds like it's somewhat random meaning um, if, if, if it wasn't determined to happen and I just did it, then why did I do it? And if the answer is, well, you just did, then that's like, that sounds like random, just some random action, then that's not responsibility either. Okay, so there has to be some explanation for how free will, free will works so that we can say, I understand why you did it. You did it because of some kind of a reason, perhaps. That's what led you to do it, but you still are freely choosing to do it. You didn't have to do it. Any of that, there is a debate whether we have free will or we are determined. And let me just say this: um, uh, perhaps there are, you know, one could say maybe the truth lies somewhere in between. That's a possibility. Like with any philosophical two positions on the extreme, 
maybe there's some truth to both of these. I already told you that libertarian is, libertarians agree that some of our actions are determined. Okay, so maybe the truth lies somewhere in between. Anyway, Kant believes in free choice. Okay? Are we good so far? I hope so. Okay, so now, um, let's, before we, we are going to get to his theory of morality uh, pretty shortly, but um, we need to spend a little time focusing on some of the differences between reason and inclination because this will help us understand and appreciate Kant's, uh, Kant's view of morality, as we'll see. So um, with regard to reason and inclination, Kant is going to say that uh, reason is in some way necessary. I'll try to explain these things in a minute. Reason is necessary, universal, and objective. And when it comes to inclination, it's going to be the opposite. Inclinations are contingent. I'll explain these terms. We may have talked about this a little bit when we talked about Plato's theory of particulars and forms, remember that? Necessary, contingent, maybe, maybe not. Okay, anyway, inclination is contingent, particular, and subjective. Oh, and by particular I mean relative as opposed to universal. Okay, so you see how necessary is the opposite of contingent, universal is the opposite of particular, objective is the opposite of subjective. Okay, so just want to spend a few minutes explaining what this all means to say that reason, maybe this is the easiest one, reason is objective. Meaning, if I'm rational, and you're rational, we should be thinking more or less exactly the same way. To the extent that we are rational creatures, we are capable of being objective. So to be objective means to sort of put your own personal standpoint aside and let's say be able to judge facts the way they are on the table, so to speak, okay? Think about uh, a court case. You know, if you're subjective, if you're going to bring your own, let's suppose you're sitting in judgment, you're on a court case, and there's somebody who's on trial, and you're trying to make a judgment about whether this person is guilty or innocent. And the judge tells you, try to make the decision based on the facts. Use reason to try to figure out whether this person is guilty or innocent. Right? So if you're going to use reason, you're supposed to try to be objective as opposed to subjective, which would mean that you'd have, let's say, your own personal bias. Remember, because inclination is the part of us that has feelings and passions and lusts and urges and inclinations. Like, for example, if you're, if you're sitting on a court and you're judging whether somebody is guilty or innocent, let's suppose you happen not to like the way that person looks. Maybe that person reminds you of some enemy you had when you were a child. Or maybe that person has a certain ethnic background or color and you kind of have a distaste for that group of people, let's suppose. All right? Well, you know, even if you don't like it, you might have such subjective biases. So your inclinations might lead you to say, I want to find this person guilty. But if you use reason, you're going to sort of set that aside. You're going to just look at the facts, cool, calm, collected. Not being a cool, calm, collected assassin, that's something else. Cool, calm, collected, judge, and based on the objective facts, try to be objective, right? And, and make a rational judgment as to whether that person is guilty or innocent, okay? So this is the idea that because we are rational, we're able to be objective. If all we had was inclination, 
we would be able to be objective, we would be subjective, we would be making decisions based on things going on inside of ourselves rather than what's out there, the fact, is the guy guilty or innocent? Okay, does everybody see that? Objective versus subjective. Reason is universal versus inclinations which are particular or relative. Now the easiest way to explain that would be is that when it comes to inclinations, I mean there are a lot of inclinations that we all happen to have. Like for example, the big one is self-preservation, right? Uh, you know, we all tend to experience hunger and thirst and we all tend to have a fear of death. We don't want to die. So, to some degree, we could say that inclinations are universal among all people. All people share similar inclinations. But then again, when it comes to some inclinations, different people are very, very different, okay? Like, for example, um, inclination include, oh, I should have mentioned this before. I, I missed something I should have said earlier, so I'm gonna say it now. Inclination, we said, includes feelings, passions. It also, one of the main inclinations, I think I did say this, self-preservation is an inclination we have, but also the drive toward pleasure, and let's call it happiness also. Happiness, pleasure, doesn't really matter whether it's the same thing or not. We all, want, we all want pleasure and we all want to avoid pain. So that's part of our inclinational nature. Um, we all have, let's suppose, you know, remember we said according to Aristotle, human beings have this fundamental desire or goal to be happy, right? Happiness is the highest good according to Aristotle, remember all that? Okay, so Kant would say that that's all inclination. We want to be happy. We want to have pleasant experiences. We don't want to have pain. Okay, well, getting back to the point about universal versus particular over here, okay? Um, inclinations can differ drastically from person to person. Isn't that so? Like, for example, what gives one person pleasure might not give another person pleasure at all. All right, some people like baseball, some people like football, some people don't like sports, some people like, you know, uh, licorice. I hate licorice, I can't stand licorice. And a set, you know that flavor, that licorice, Oof, drives me batty. All right, so some people like drinking, some people like smoking, some people hate that stuff. It doesn't get, cause them pain, pleasure. It's all over the place. When it comes to our inclinations, there is, there, we're, we're very particular and unique. People are very different when it comes to what gives them pleasure or pain, at least to some degree. I mean, this is not 100% true because you might say, well, wait a second, no one likes to be beaten with a baseball bat, so isn't that universal? But we all, everybody, you know, doesn't like certain things. We all like to eat when we're hungry, so isn't that like universal? So what I'm saying is, that's true about some inclinations that we do share, but there are many, many inclinations that some people have that other people don't have, all right? But insofar as we are rational beings, this is what Kant would say, insofar as we are rational beings, we are all gonna be the same, okay? There's no such thing. You might disagree with this, by the way. There are people who do disagree with this. But Kant would say, there's no such thing, there, there is such a thing as Chinese food, you know, there's Italian food, Chinese food, there's Thai, there's Japanese, there's Indian cuisine, they're, they're very different, maybe there's some similarities, you know, there's southern, fry, southern home cooking, and there's, that's very different from, you know, Middle Eastern cooking, I guess, Middle Eastern food, people have different tastes, different things that they like. But there's no such thing as Chinese logic or British logic. There's no such thing as American rational thinking and then there's like, you know, Persian rational thinking. If we are thinking rationally, to the extent that we think rationally, all, human, all humans are exactly alike. 
Reason doesn't change from person to person. Now that doesn't mean that we don't have disagreements, because obviously we do. You know what I mean? I mean, there are we can you can get into a discussion, as you know from studying philosophy and other topics. Rational people can sometimes disagree. Now, often they do, right? Rational people do disagree about certain things. Okay, but. When rational people disagree about certain things, usually what one person says is, I don't know why you don't agree with me. If I'm giving you a rational argument, then you should be able to see that I'm right. And the other guy says, well, I'm telling you that the way I see things, you should be agreeing with me because this is my argument. All right, so to the extent that we, that we are rational creatures, we are all the same. To the extent that we are inclinational creatures, we can be very, very different. And I put the term relative over here because not only do we differ from person to person, but we differ from country to country, from place to place, from time to time. Our inclinations can shift over time. Like, you know, it might be that, you know, like fashion, for example. Fashion, what people like to wear, what people like to eat, what kind of movies, what kind of music we like to listen to. That's all going under the bag of inclination. And that changes from time to time, from place to place, from country to country. That's relative versus reason, which, according to Kant anyway, it is what it is. It's the same for all humans at all times at all places. Okay, and now finally, this term up here, necessary versus contingent. Um, have we talked about this? before, necessary versus contingent? Okay. Um, necessary means it has to be the way it is. It's fixed. It's set in stone, so to speak. Something is necessary if there isn't much room for change or flexibility. It is what it is. Okay, so, I mean, for example, Kant, Plato, you know, would have agreed with this, by the way, that when we use reason in its purest sense, we're gonna be able to figure out what is necessarily true. Like, for example, the forms. Remember how Plato thought that the forms exist and they are necessary, they're indestructible, they're eternal, they are forever, they are what they are, they are not going to change. Whereas Plato said the particulars of this world, like this particular chair and this particular pair of glasses, that can change, that can break, that can you know become a different color. Right, particulars are contingent. The word contingent, the word contingent means they can change from time to time. It's all contingent. We use that word uh, in English, in ordinary English, we say that, well, that's contingent. I'm not sure that that's gonna happen. It's contingent, you know, if I say, I'm gonna play baseball tomorrow, but that's contingent on the weather. That means it's dependent. It's iffy, iffy, I-F-F-Y. Okay, so think of iffy here. Um, contingent is iffy, changeable, could be different, might have been different, could have been different, whereas necessary is more like close to being eternal, fixed, must be the way it is. Contingent means it's a matter of chance. Necessary means no, it's not a matter of chance, it is what it is, it's going to be that way, it's not going to change. Okay, so that's what the terms mean. Now, I was talking a little bit about Plato, getting back to Kant. So Kant says, inclinations are contingent. They're iffy, they're chancy. Like, for example, uh, some people really, really like football, okay? Some people are football fans. Like, I happen to be a Colts fan, unfortunately, okay? I wish I was a Titans fan, but I'm a Colts fan because the Titans are doing better. Anyway, what's the point? The point is that one of my passions is to go to Colts games and watch Colts games and root for Colts games, and I am happy when the Colts win, and I am sad when the Colts lose. Okay, why? Why am I a Colts fan? I could have been a Titans fan. I mean, the distance between Louisville and, you know, Tennessee versus Louisville and Indianapolis. It's not that big of a difference. Like, why couldn't I have been a Titans fan? Why do I have to be a Colts fan? Well, that's the way inclinations work. Why do I happen to like 
you know, certain kinds of foods or certain kinds of drinks or certain kinds of games or certain kinds of this or that, and somebody else likes something else, there's no real reason because inclinations don't necessarily work by reason. They just are what they are, okay? Whereas reason, that's different. Insofar as I am a rational creature, okay? See, that's the thing. The funny thing about the human is that we are mixed. We are mixed creatures. People talk about being mixed race. Well, the human being is a mixed creature. We have inclinations, and yet we also have reason. Again, what, insofar as we are rational, we're capable of understanding and knowing and figuring out things that are necessary that have to be true. Whereas insofar as we are creatures of inclination, it's unpredictable what particular inclinations a given person is going to have. <coughs> okay, I can't, like if I look at a person, I can't know what, they, what do they like, what do they don't like unless I get to know them and find out, well, they happen to like certain things and they don't like other things. Okay, but when it comes to reason, if they're a rational creature, then we should be you know, thinking the same way, ideally, uh, about certain things, to the extent that we are rational. So, this is the contrast between reason and inclination, and why I'm telling you all these things about reason and inclination will become clearer as we go on and get into Kant's theory of what morality is. But I'll give you a tip, I'll give you just a little bit of a tip of the iceberg here, is that Kant is going to say, he's going to argue that reason is the source of morality, not inclination, okay? This is Kant's, so to speak, his project. This is the goal we're heading toward. Kant thinks that it's a bad idea, for various reasons we'll get into. Kant thinks that it's a bad idea to say that morality comes from anything having to do with inclination. The desire for pleasure, for happiness, it's going to be contingent, particular, subjective, iffy, chancy. Kant wants to say that morality comes from reason, which is objective, universal, and necessary. Okay. Excuse me, so for example, who's going to say, Kant is going to be a universalist, talking about moral universalism. I know that some of you wrote about it in your papers. I know that some of you, in some of you in your papers, argued in favor of subjectivism. Some of you, not all of you. But um, Kant is going to be a universalist because he's going to want to say, he's going to claim that using reason we can figure out and know what is moral and what is not moral, and it's gonna be the same for everybody, it's gonna be objective, and it's gonna be something that doesn't change. Okay, so for example, for Kant, if it's immoral to murder, that can't be just like an accident or something that, ha it happens to be true that, you know, that murder is immoral, right? Like it does, it happens to be true that I'm a Colts fan, it happens to be true that there's, you know, trees outside this window. There could have been no trees. Trees could be erased. Okay, so certain things are contingent. Certain things are necessary. And Kant is going to argue that moral truths, moral laws, as he's going to call them, are fixed. They're necessary and they're knowable through reason. Okay. Do we have any questions about anything I've been saying so far? Okay, so that's the background. Now we're going to talk about what Kant has to say about morality. And so um, in particular, the way uh, Kant argues in the reading, I did send you a reading, I believe. <coughs> so in that reading, uh, Kant his strategy is, he wants to, his goal, among other things, he's got a lot of goals, one goal is that Kant is going to argue that there is a fundamental moral principle. Now we talked about this term when we were learning about Mill, do you remember? Remember this? Mill believes in an FMP, 
fundamental moral principle. That is, the definition of a fundamental moral principle is, if you recall, a single rule which you could use to determine what is right or wrong in any given circumstance. Right? That's the idea of a fundamental moral principle. And Mill claimed that he had found what the fundamental moral principle is. It's the principle of utility. So Kant, I think I may have mentioned this in a previous class, but Kant agrees that there is a fundamental moral principle, but he would disagree with, with Mill. He doesn't think it's the principle of utility. Do you remember what the principle, of course, you remember the principle of utility is about social happiness, and Kant thinks that's not what morality is all about, promoting happiness. Forget it. According to Kant, that's wrong. But he does think that there is a fundamental moral principle. And he sets out to lay out an argument to build up to that fundamental moral principle. But his strategy, the strategy that Kant uses, is he starts off by making certain claims that he thinks anybody's going to agree with, at least anybody who has common sense. Okay, Common sense is something that we all have. You don't have to be a philosopher or maybe even a college student to have common sense, right? So Kant wants to build up toward his fundamental principle by going through what he calls three propositions. I'll write them on the board. Three propositions of common sense morality. All right? Kant... this reading, he's got three propositions of common sense morality. And again, the idea of common sense is, you know, everybody has common sense. We can all use common sense to just make certain judgments about what we think is right or wrong, true or false. So he's going to give us three propositions of common sense morality, and that's going to lead us to what he thinks is the fundamental moral principle. So here we go with number one. I'm going to uh, put it down here, write it on the board, and then we'll talk about it. It goes like this, an action as genuine moral worth only if it is done from of duty, D-U-T-Y. Okay, just think about this for a second. An action has genuine moral worth only if it is done from the motive of duty. Now, thankfully, Kant gives a very nice example of what he thinks will show that this is true, okay? So Kant gives us an example of an action which is not done from duty, and it's called the shopkeeper example. Shopkeeper. The shopkeeper example. And in this example, it has to do with, as you might guess, a shopkeeper, someone who keeps a shop, a store owner. I'm gonna go through the example with you, and we'll talk about it, okay? I'm not going to try to write the whole example down on the board. It would take too long, but it's pretty simple to follow, okay? So Kant asks the following situation, okay? You imagine like a, a shop. It's like a boutique where there's all these fancy chocolates and candies, maybe like, you know, Godiva chocolates. Ever been in Godiva chocolates? Used to be in the mall. I used to go there a lot. Anyway... Imagine you have a shop with fancy candies and chocolates and little sort of knickknacks and stuff like that, 
And it's an old fashioned shop. There's only one person who's like running the store. And one day, a child, let's call it a 10 year old kid, comes into the store and he's browsing around the store looking for something and the shopkeeper's standing there and looking at the kid and he sees that the kid has a $20 bill in his hand, 20 bucks in his hand. And he's looking around the store, looking around, trying to find something interesting. And uh, after looking around for 15 minutes, the boy, the child, fixes on something that looks, oh, this looks really interesting, maybe I should buy that. And the boy, the child, asks the shopkeeper, how much does this cost? What is the price of this, sir? And the shopkeeper, now, because you know, in a fancy store, they don't have the prices listed on anything, you know? Right. Okay, you have to ask, how much does this cost? So anyway, the shopkeeper knows that the fair price, the true price of that candy is actually $5, all right? But the shopkeeper's thinking in his mind, this guy is a little bit greedy, the shopkeeper. And he's thinking, I could easily tell the kid it's actually $15. I see he's got a $20 bill. He looks like he really wants it. If I say $15, he's probably going to say, yes, I want it anyway. So the shopkeeper is about to say, that candy is $15 which would be dishonest and lying and not true, okay? That would be an immoral thing to do. What would the moral thing to do? The moral thing to do would be to tell the truth, right? Say, that's five bucks, right? <coughs> now, at the very last second, he's about, he's tempted. He's tempted to tell the child that it's $15, but he starts thinking, you know what? If I charge a kid $15 and he buys it, what's gonna happen? He's gonna go home to mom Mom is gonna say, what'd you get at the store? He's gonna say, I bought this. And she's gonna say, how much was it? And he's gonna say $15. And she's gonna say, what? That, that XYZ person. She's gonna go running back to the store. She's gonna raise a whole stink, call the Better Business Bureau, call the cops, put, you know, protest in front of the store saying, this guy, he's cheap, he's a liar. He ripped me off, he ripped my kid off. So, at the last, this is all running through the shopkeeper's head as he's about to state the price of this item. And finally he says, it's $5. Okay? That is the example of the shopkeeper. It's basically an example of someone who does the right thing, but he didn't do it because he thought it was the right thing to do. He simply did it because he didn't want to avoid bad consequences, right? He didn't want to get in trouble. He did it for a selfish reason. He did it because he didn't, you know, he wants his business to flourish. He wants to be happy. He wants to make money in the long run. So he made a decision, okay, I really would have rather cheated the kid. If he could have gotten away with it, that's what he would have done. Let's assume that. If he knew for sure that the child was not going to tell his parent what the story was, he would have cheated the kid. The only reason he didn't cheat the kid was because of his own selfish desires, wants, and needs. Now, that is an example of a, an action that was not done from the motive of duty. Is everybody clear on this? He didn't do it because of duty. He did it because of self-interest or happiness or some kind of greed, essentially. Says Kant, that action does not have genuine moral worth. An action only has genuine moral worth if it is done because it was the right thing to do. Okay, so here, for one thing, we can put this down as a little side note, is that for Kant, the intent or the motive, <coughs> the motive of the action is so important. According to Kant, if the motive was off, if the motive was bad, wrong, if the motive wasn't because it's the right thing to do, 
that means the action, in this case the action of the shopkeeper, is not genuinely moral, morally worthy. Now, he's not saying, don't make the mistake to think, he's not saying that what the shopkeeper did was bad. He didn't commit an immoral action, but he didn't actually perform a moral act because his action was not motivated by considerations of what is the right thing to do, what is my duty. Okay? I want to give you another example. Now that's Kant's own example. If you do the reading, you'll see he talks about the shopkeeper example. And I encourage everybody to do the reading. But I want to give you another example that Kant talks about elsewhere in his writings, just to give you the flavor of this thing. Um, let's suppose that you are a mom. You're a mom of a kid, a toddler. And one day, you are looking out your window, and you see your toddler is somehow gotten out of the house and is running, walking or running across the street. And this is a busy street. There are cars coming down the street. You are horrified, out of your wits. And actually, as you, as you begin to get out of the house and say, Johnny, Johnny, come back, or whatever your kid's name is, you see that there is a car coming down the street. And they're not necessarily looking for some little toddler walking across the street. You rush into the street. You grab your kid and jump across to the other sidewalk. And you save your child. All right? Now, Kant would say something like this. What was the motive? Why did you do what you did? Did you do it because it was your duty? In that case, if you're a mom, your, your instincts kick in of maternal instincts, right? Your maternal instincts kick in, and you want to save your kid. You're just like, you, you're not even really thinking about what you're doing. You're thinking about what you're doing, but you're not thinking about duty, schmooty. What? I'm just saving my kid. I just have a natural urge to save my kid. Okay, I'm not doing it because it's right. I'm doing it just because I'm a mom and that's what I have to do. So there, Kant would say, if you, di if you did not do it because it was your duty, if you didn't do it because it was the right thing, again, your action does not have genuine moral worth. Now maybe that's a harder example to swallow than my shopkeeper, or rather Kant's shopkeeper example. Okay, but that's what Kant thinks. When you're acting out of passion and instinct and self, especially if you're acting out of self-gratification or the needs to serve your own psyche, psychic happiness, then the action does not have genuine moral worth. Okay, similarly, if you jump out of the way of an oncoming truck, I gave you the example of the mom, but let's suppose you're walking across the street and you're on Bardstown Road, you're walking across the street, and you have the green light. You know, you're up at Douglas Loop, there's those lights, right? And you walk across, and all of a sudden you see a truck coming right at you. And this truck, the guy is not looking, he's just driving. And you jump out of the way, you save your life. Okay, now, Kant believes that you have a duty to save your life. You're not, it's not moral to let yourself get killed for no good reason. We can talk about maybe maybe there are possibly possibly could be reasons for letting yourself get killed, but in general, you don't have the right to give up your life. You should not let yourself get hit by a truck. But if you jump out of the most people who jump out of the way of a truck are going to be doing it out of inclination. They're going to be doing it out of self-preservation just that's an instinct. I don't even think about it. I'm just jumping out of the way. I'm not thinking, well, I really have a duty to save my life, so therefore, I'm jumping, right? You're just gonna jump out of the way of the truck because of the natural instinct to do so, okay? So again, in that situation, Kant is gonna say, you, didn't, you really didn't do a moral action. Yes, you saved your life, we're happy for you, you're happy, your kids are happy, I'm happy. Happy, 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 but no moral, no moral action has actually occurred here. Because unless you did it because it was the right thing to do, 
the action does not have GMW, genuine moral worth. So, I'd like to pause here and ask you all, what do you think about this claim that Kant is making? Does everybody get the claim? Does everybody uh, understand the shopkeeper example at least? And the claim that he's making about the shopkeeper, do you agree that someone who does an action but it's not done out of the right motive, the action doesn't have genuine moral worth? Do you, have, do you have a thought? Okay, that's your, I'm trying to raise your hand. Does anybody agree with Kant or think that they, that he's right? Action does not have genuine moral worth because it wasn't done from duty. Yes, I, Karen? I agree, I think. Okay, so we have one agreeer. Do we have any other agreeers or disagreeers? All right, well, let me ask you this question. What do you think Mill would say about this claim? Would Mill agree with this? Trying to get you, trying to get you to think about Mill a little bit here. Would Mill agree that if the, the motive was off, therefore the action doesn't have genuine moral worth? Josh, you have a thought? Uh, wasn't he like a, uh, was he like more focused on the outcome? Indeed. Right, so Mill would disagree with this. You might want to make a note of that in your notes, okay? Mill would say no. Mill would say if the action brings about the right result, that's what counts. If the action, and now for him, according to Mill, we would judge the action by its consequences. Remember we talked about consequentialism in the case of Mill. Mill would say, if the action promoted the greatest amount of social happiness out of all the available options, well then it's the right one. So certainly in the case of the mom saving her child or the person jumping out of the way of the truck, it doesn't matter what their motive is. They did the action that promoted social happiness. They did a moral action. Okay, so there is a very sharp disagreement between Kant and Mill on this particular point. All right. Well, Kant thinks that people, common sense is that he's right. He thinks that people will agree with him. So I think we have time. I told you there were three propositions. Let's try to get into number two. Okay, so here's proposition number two, and we'll see that this has also to do with something similar, but uh, the structure here is, he says, if you agree with number one, you should agree with number two. Okay, number two is supposed to follow from number one. If you agree with me on this one, then you should agree with me on number two. So let me write this on the board here. An action has genuine moral worth not, not because of the consequences, not because of its consequences, But rather, now we're going to say something positive, but rather because, oops, rather because of the maxim, and we'll have to talk about this funny word maxim, rather because of the maxim under which it was done. So obviously this has like a part A and a part B. Part A is this, an action has genuine moral worth, not because of its consequences, 
part B is, but rather because of the maxim under which it is done. Now, like I said, the word maxim here, we'll get to that. We'll get to that later. But if we focus on the first half of it, OK, this basically is what we might call anti-consequentialism. Anti-consequentialism is saying, whatever it is that makes an action have moral worth, it's not the consequences. The net result, the net gain, is not what makes it morally right or have moral worth. OK, now, can everybody see why, if you believe this, you should at least believe this? OK, the argument is, listen, if you're agreeing with me, look, let's suppose you have two shopkeepers. One of them tells the fair price because of self-interest, because he's afraid of getting caught, because he's afraid of negative consequences. One of them does the exact same thing from an external point of view. He does the same thing. He tells the fair price, but he does it because it's the right thing to do. Well, in both cases, the net result is exactly the same. He told the fair price. The child gets his cookie or his candy for five bucks. Mom is not fed up. Everything goes honky-dory. The net result is exactly the same. But if you agreed that in the case of the guy who does it out of a selfish motive, his action doesn't have genuine moral worth, but in the other case where somebody does it out of duty, it does have moral worth, that proves conclusively that this must be true. Actions do not get their moral worth because of consequences. If all that mattered was consequences, then intent wouldn't change anything. OK, so he thinks that if you accepted number one, you should be accepting the first part of number two. Consequences don't make something morally right. OK, now this latter part, but rather because of the maxim under which it is done, or was done. So this is a little bit more mysterious. So. What is a maxim? Let's just talk about that a little bit. What Kant means by a maxim. <coughs> OK, so a maxim is a rule of some sort, a rule for action which a person adopts that has the form, all right, that has the form when I am in circumstances X, now X could be a lot of different things, such as when I find myself in the position of being faced with an oncoming truck. X could be numbers of things. When I am in circumstances X, I will do action Y. OK, so this, I grant you, this is a little bit complicated. Like, what are we talking about here? Maxim, maxim, what's going on with this? rule that you adopt for your behavior. So the thing is, Kant believes that any time we choose to act, if we make a choice, any time a person choose to, chooses to act, they're going to be acting based on some kind of a maxim that they've chosen for themselves as a general rule, OK? In other words, I mean, to give an example, you know, there, there's the simple example of a maxim would be, like, let's suppose, let's suppose I'm thirsty, so I go take a drink. I choose to go take a drink because I'm thirsty. Well, there's a maxim that I'm acting on. A maxim is a rule, again, of this form. In that case, the maxim would be something like, whenever I find myself thirsty, I I'll get a drink. It's a very simple thing when you boil it down to that kind of example, right? 
But can thinks, again, whenever we act, whenever we choose to act, we're acting on the basis of a maxim. If I get up in the morning and I decide to come to class, I'm probably, well, Kant would say, I'm, I'm, there's some kind of a maxim I'm choosing to act on. The maxim in that case is something like, when it's time to go to school, when it's time to go to my job, I get myself going and go, okay? So um, we'll have to stop here because we're out of time for today, but basically what this is saying is, if it's not because of the consequences, there has to be something about the maxim that I'm acting on that makes it have moral worth, okay? Now there are gonna be good maxims and bad maxims. Not any maxim is gonna be a good one, but that's gonna be the next step. We're gonna have to see what maxims are ones that are morally good to act on, and that will be something we talk about next time. Thank you.